the meditation is it, it it's always cliche but it's changed my life it's again cliche but it's made me a better person Ten seconds more! Ten seconds more! Push ups! Push ups! Push ups! Push ups! The goal is to ride 200 kilometers, getting that average speed up. Come on. Thanks for having me. Super stoked to be on. DJ, I'm looking forward to this. I had a first question planned, but then we were just chatting off air before we got going and we were talking about meditation and things like that. So, I actually want to start there. I think it's a more interesting place to start than the question I had planned. I find when I talk to, I I love to meditate and we have a mutual friend as well. And we were talking about his love for meditation as well. But I find when I talk to a lot of people that they see meditation as it's this thing that I do for this allotted moment of time, I'm going to meditate for 15 minutes and that's my mindfulness section of the day. And so in this one place is my meditation and now the rest of my day goes on. But I feel like the interviews I've listened to you in the past and research for this podcast, that you're someone who doesn't segment. They've nearly moved to another stage of meditation where you're bringing that mindfulness now into your cycling and into your art, which we'll touch on later. Yeah. Uh, meditation is, it, it, it's always cliche, but it's changed my life. It's, again cliche but it's made me a better person um it's funny i i started it last april and uh my wife you know last april i just was a mess i mean obviously everyone was with uh, like just covid kind of hitting and figuring out like i just started this brand new team and brand imaginary collective and you're all of a sudden can't go to races and you're like how am i gonna get paid and then you're thinking like, man, if people aren't, don't have jobs, how are they going to buy art? So I was, I was stressing like crazy last year. And it like, I look back now and I'm just like, man, that was so like crazy of me to be stressing. Like that's, those are just uncontrollable. Like my life was good. Like I was healthy, but I was stressing to the point where I couldn't go out and enjoy a bike ride because I would just like in my head, I would just run through things. And I like, it just was crazy. And my wife's like, oh, let's go do this. This guy's doing this Wim Hof session at the reservoir. And that's, so it was where you do deep breathing and then you hold your breath and then you release, do that three times. And then you get into cold water, which is around like that water that day was like 40, 40 degrees. And I look around and as like a high end athlete, I thought I was like this, like, oh man, I had such an ego. I was going to beat everyone. My whole, <laughs> my whole attitude and which was just so wrong about it. My whole attitude was to beat people. You know, I was like, I want to be the last one in the water. I want to outbeat people. That's a recipe and for hypothermia, isn't it? That's that. Well, yeah, that's because you're not relaxing the body and you're not, you're letting your ego get in the way of what your body and the not living in the natural moment can do. So, because when you get in the water, it was crazy. I got in the water and I look around and the people who did, were doing this meditation with me, like maybe five or six other people, we're probably in their like 50s to 70s so like elderly people and you're like oh i can outbeat the, them in the water and i was the first one out and they were in there for another 15 minutes and i just real at that point i just realized geez how weak my mind is and that you know i need to do something about that and with being at home you know with covid you're just like you know okay i'm gonna start like I'm not one who sits around or I'm not one who ever uses excuses. I like to just, you know, all right, let's, let's, this is our situation. Let's get, let's try this. And I was like, well, let's better, let's see if this will better me. And I started doing it like 10 minutes, 15 minutes every day. So it started out with like Sam Harris waking up. Yeah, I would, I would wake up at, I would wake up in the morning. Like I usually wake up at sunrise. That's no problem for me. And then I do uh, breath work. Uh, I do Wim Hof and I, you know, where you, like I said, you do deep breaths and then you hold it and yeah, it, it's really incredible the places you can go. And it's crazy. The more I did it, you know, it felt good at the first time, 
But the more I did it, I realized I was actually fi- seeing this place that's there when you're in this meditative state. And, like, and so from the forest out and first people trying to get into it. Uh, so I have similar experience, went to a Wim Hof clinic and your sounds way more oh. hardcore than mine because they only had us in like these ice baths for like five minutes. We didn't get that yeah. opportunity to push ourselves. Uh, but from that then, did you move into like a guided meditation? I know a lot of people use like guided apps or did you just stick with the yeah. method? Yeah, I, I, well, the teacher who I, we learned from, he was certified by Wim Hof and lived in India. And so we were seeing him like after that, you know, seeing him once a month to do those outdoor uh, breathing and water therapy. But yeah, I was doing it every day and I just downloaded an app called Insight Timer. And it's super great where it t- keeps track of all that. And uh, it allows you to do all these different meditations. And like I said, for me, I really love the Wim Hof because I feel like it push like you can feel all your energy relax as you do it. You know, I like to describe it as like, a tuning fork when you hit a tuning fork and it's like all crazy at first and then it slowly rolls down that's what our energy is when we allow it to be the stress of the bo- of the day stress of the world it's crazy it's bouncing around us we're tight people are tense you see it and then once you get into this place you realize wow i can slowly like hear that frequency and slow it down and it just starts you, through your body you start feeling those tinglings and it starts slowing down and then you're in this place, this meditated state. And the longer I was there, I started realizing, okay, I'm here. Now what? Like you're in this calm, calm place. And then I started learning, like I said, about manifestation. And I had their, like our, our yogi teacher teach me a little bit more about manifestation. And so I'm like, okay, I'll give this a try. And so when I'm in this meditated state, then I'll start manifesting, manifesting. And at first I would be like still searching worldly items or still searching worldly like kind of pleasures. I would be like, all right, I want to sell a painting. I want to get this. I want to sign with Santa Cruz. I want to do this, this, this. And then next thing I know, they're all coming true. And you're like, okay, this is crazy. (laughs) And so you realize like, but then you realize like there's more to like, it's coming true and it's that easy. So why am I asking for like, it's not fulfilling anything when I ask for these worldly things, you know what I mean? Like you'd sell a painting and just cause it was at more money, it didn't make me happier. Like what made me happier was when my wife was happy, my daughter, when I got good exercise, when I got to paint, when I got to create, uh, that makes me happy. Or when I feel that I'm in a creative environment. Reversing to the cold therapy. Do you find parallels between the sort of inner peace you get from the cold therapy where you just can't focus or think of anything else, only that moment and riding up the side of a mountain full gas where it's only the effort that matters. Oh here. yeah. That's the same, same meditated state when you're doing, you know, yeah. End of the race and you have a 20 minute climb that's going to be full gas and you're, you can't even, you tunnel out everyone. You know, I could, ch- I could channel that meditated play. It's the best way I describe it is like the movie soul in the Disney movie when they're in like that, that place and it's like oh okay this is this makes sense when you're in that you know zone and uh yeah i i would in the cold i i fell in love with the cold water like crazy because i just crave it now where i take cold showers every day but i really crave like the really cold like 30 34 even like 27 because what you do is you put uh you put epsom salt in the water and that helps it that doesn't allow it to freeze did you make so you like can a get home, it. homemade like plunge pill um this yo- the yogi here uh i do he has like a nice ice uh it's just a freezer and then you fill it with water and then nice. you put see uh epsom salts and yeah it's crazy how you crave it and it's what i felt like it teaches you is the water is this beautiful teacher where it shows you like instant stress instant your body like as soon as it's in the water every siren in your like neurosystem and everything's just like going crazy and you realize oh man nothing is actually happening to me no harm is actually like i'm okay this is just water like it's the water just happens to be cold but if you look at any other animals they just they're fine they're able to turn off that and realize that 
you know, oh, wow, I'm actually fine. The cold water is not going to hurt me, you know, and you can control your breath and you start to go into a focus. And what I like to do is actually it's called the uh, Kundalini breath. Uh, so fire breath. And that's then where you like, well, exhale. And it, you, you have to have someone teach it to you. Uh, but it actually then it put, starts a fire from within, like a warmth. And you'll start to feel it through your body. And you can like, there's these monks in, uh, I forget where, but they actually use, you know, it as a game. So they'll jump in the snow, use the Kundalini breath and see who can melt the snow the fastest. Uh, you must ping me on a link to that. Check it out. Yeah, I got, I mean, I, I heard it from, uh, uh, when I was talking to, when that, my yogi teacher taught me that breath and he was like, yeah, this is like a game that they would use when, you know, he was in India or whatever. And like, they would just go out and play in the snow and just see who can melt things. And I'm just like, geez, that's hardcore. Like I'm not <laughs> at that, but like, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, I could talk about meditation and all this all day where I feel like it's been a great tool for me you know and uh do you wish it yeah. was a tool you had so like rewind into what was it 2014 when you won the under 23 time trial championships yeah i think so do you wish you had or do you think your career in the road would have been different if you had a oh. tool like meditation back then yeah i felt like if i would have been practicing this breath i felt like i probably would have been unstoppable like on pretty like pretty when because honestly if there's one thing i think any athlete should be doing it's this high-end breath work and meditation because when you're doing this breath work and meditation like i said you can start to feel your body tingle and that helps your body's like bloodstream and it, you know help lactic acid everything move around help recover and also when you're doing this oxygen you're inhaling more oxygen so if i would have done this prior to that time trial you just said I think I would have won it by three minutes. <laughs> like it's not, that's not me being cocky. It's just knowing how strong and just also knowing because I was practicing a little bit of manifestation then. And you know, where you'd man, you'd, and also where I would just go out and train and I'd just be like, all right, I'm going to win the time trial. I'm going to win it. I'm going to win it. I'm going to win it by a minute and a half. I'm going to do so many Watts. And when that day, when I, it was like, when I won it, it was just like, Oh yeah, there was, written out for me you know it was like of course i'm gonna win and so had i practiced this meditation every day where i could have you know you're meditating on oh i'm gonna win this race i'm gonna do this i'm gonna then move up at this place i'm gonna you know it's and just again like i said the breath work before prologues and time trials allowing more oxygen in your lungs and body because it's crazy through this breath work i'm able to hold my breath for four minutes when you're in these meditated states and if you're able to do that, that means your body's oxygenated. And then if your body's oxygenated before doing a big high end effort, like, you know how they get like a kind of smoker's cough after yeah. a hard TT or a prologue. Yeah, I call it pursuer's would, cough. Yeah. You want to get that because your body would already be oxygenated at a high level because you are doing that heavy breathing prior to the, uh, you know, and even also in the Peloton, I look back when I was in the Peloton, you know, and people like kind of be easy, breathe, like trying to look like easy breathing, like, oh, yeah, you know, just breathing through my nose. No, like you should be taking <gasps> deep, constant, constant breaths. Like, like I have you seen Sep Kuss, of- like Sep Kuss, like right in the final? The dude's barely breathing. I'm like, hey, yeah, he, he looks like he's on his own too, right? Yeah, I'll have to talk to him because he likes to come hang out in Southern Utah and I'll, uh, I'll have him do some edit, some meditation with me uh but that's honestly like i do tell i coach some guys and i i tell them like i'd rather them do the medit the 30 minutes of meditation or the 10 minutes of meditation than get in the ride and it's crazy they don't you know they don't get like no the meditation is actually more important than that ride because it's gonna when you do that meditation it's gonna then make you more motivated to go on the ride it's gonna make you more focused when you're on the ride and it's going to, like I said, oxygenate your body. So then you're jumping on the bike and feeling great. So looking back with sort of this meditation as a tool, if you're looking back at that kid who was national time trial champion. And we would not have been friends. He would not have liked me. Is that kid happy how, how it's all turned out? 
or did, oh, he, did he have a different that kid, vision? That kid would not. That kid would not be. That kid would be feeling sad for himself, like, oh man, oh I'm not racing a world tour, blah blah blah. Was it all Me, about world tour then? Yeah, I didn't care about anything else back then. Like there was, and I had sacrificed. I I was like, I gotta sacrifice everything. I was super over. Like it was just like, man, that that just wasn't what, who I was meant to be, you know. And even though I was talented with it, it just wasn't me, you know. I was not ever meant. And that was just, you know, the quicker I realized that was then the quicker that uh, more success came and more doors actually like. Yeah, I always described it as me trying to like swim up a river rather than float with it. You know, you're, you're in the right river with cycling. I love cycling. I love bikes, but I'm in the wrong, I'm going the wrong direction. And as mm -hmm. soon as I did that, all of a sudden Santa Cruz was knocking at the door, ever these big companies. And it was like, wow, I'm way more happier. They see who I am more as a person. They allow me to, you know, they see that my artwork, is way more valuable than my cycling. They see that, you know, I have other things in my life that I pursue and prefer. And also that I prefer, you know, just the enjoyment of the ride. So when I go to events, it's about making sure others are having a great time as well. And I'm just kind of this like happy, good, you know, hype man, you know. <laughs> Do you have to be all in for a world tour? Oh, Do you do you think yeah, you could have made it with balance now? Oh, no, no. You you see you see how everyone is training now. They're training with your uh, training camps either, you know, most of the year or a high altitude camps or you're training on your bike. You have to now be training like five hours average, basically, I feel like a day. They're training at a high, high level now where like you see just every year it's, and it's it's not going to get any easier if you think about it because they're just going to try to get faster and faster and faster. And so that just requires more and more attention to detail. And for me, I didn't want to put all my cards into one thing. I wanted to, like I said, I like, I like waking up in the morning, going riding my mountain bike, then heading over and doing a mural in my city and then coming home and working on a painting for a client and then going off and doing a road ride or you know, going swimming with my family, you know, uh, there was just other things that I preferred to do. Did you have this epiphany while you were like, when did this epiphany take place? Was it like, you're still chasing that world tour dream of contracts and you're starting to see like, I don't fit into this world or is it, I'm, I've run out of opportunities here. Now it's fine myself. Yeah. I mean, there was always kind of that feeling I felt like where I felt like I would make a decision and then I would fit it. Then it would just be like, Oh man, that probably wasn't the right one. You know, where like choosing BMC or going with Axel Merckx or doing this or that. And so like, there was all the ways like that kind of in your mind where you're like, uh, I don't know, you're, you're playing with that. But the epiphany really hit me hard where it was like, man, I'm chasing, chasing a dream. That's not even mine. You know, like it's just, like when you're a child, you grow up around your family or you grow up around like, you know, I don't know, whatever, if so, whoever supports you and, you know, helps you achieve your dream or, you know, motivates you or like for me, cycling was a, a common interest that, you know, me, my dad and brother could all share. So therefore you're bonding over that like crazy. So you don't really know that like, oh, that's actually like this goal of world tour and the Tour de France is kind of this like group dream you know what i mean yeah. or this and it's like you think in your mind it's your dream because you do love cycling and you do love it but it's not the, it's not your total dream because now i'm living my my absolute dream you know now i wake up and it's like it literally feels like how a child feels like when they're like all right whom like what friend am i gonna go hang out with today uh, what am I going to do? Like, am I going to ride my bike? Am I going to paint? Like it literally just, I've made my life where, you know, I could almost live like a child and, you know, enjoy life rather than work. I, I think it's so silly how people are like, oh no, you need to get a job so you can put money away so you can retire. And that's just what you have to do. And it's like, well, 
I, I already feel like I'm retired. Like I can sell paintings till the day, literally the day I die. I can ride a bike almost till the day I die. Like I hope I do. You know what I mean? Like I, if, why would I get a job that requires me to sacrifice more than half my life to then just have the last final 20 years and have a bank full of money? You know, it's like, it feels like for me, the really fun part of the journey of cycling is, you know, when you get started at the very beginning and you just don't know how far you can go. And it's like, oh my God, I can win a local race. Oh, I can win a cat two race. I can win a cat one race. Oh, I can get to go to abroad. I can race in France. I can yeah. race in Belgium. But it gets to a point where as you step up each rung on the ladder, the level of commitment needed to get to the next rung increases. And at some point, the trade-off for me anyway just wasn't worth it. I'm like living in France and I'm missing like my sister's yeah. birthday, my mom's and dad's anniversary. I'm missing my graduation. And I'm like, what am I doing this for? Like, did do you have a similar experience with that where it's like that squeeze of yeah, that, that was the year, uh, oh man, 2018. Uh, me and my wife had just gotten married and I just found out I had a two year contract and then I just found out that the team had lost a sponsor. Is this with and so then that, no, this was with Hincapie. Uh, so they had then just lost a sponsor. So then that, made it so they didn't have enough money so then they had to cut everyone's contracts so then you went from having a contract that was awesome to then something that was like wait what i i i, I performed i did all this people forget like i was 12th at tour of croatia with three people testing positive the winner of that race so like i was you know people put all this pressure and like i was t top 20 at tour of california and i even had a crash and I, uh, outside of like the three K one of uh, the sprint days. And I was with the Egan Bernal winning, like, and I didn't even have a climbing team to support me. So people think like, Oh no, I had the results. I, again, I just didn't have the personality. Like I'm way too open and I'm way too controversial as well. Like, uh, so that, you know, but so that year in 2018, I was just like, wait, I did all my work and that, why did that get cut? You know, like, I felt like if someone should not get paid, if someone, if there's a reason I should not get paid, it should be my own fault. You know what I mean? Like it should have been that I didn't perform or that I didn't come through. But the fact that it was someone else not coming through, I was like, wait, that's not, it's not fair. You can do that. There's and a narrow so, window right I, there between like what you're saying, because as you're going up the level, your dedication needed, it's getting more and more and more and more. But if the amount of cash you're making isn't commensurate with that, because the risk is yeah. getting higher as well. Like there's a lot more chance of you getting hit by a car crashing. Like, yeah, well, we had, we, I just degree. got married. I just got married. And then we just found out that uh, we we're going to have a baby. And that's when it really hit me that day. You talk about the epiphany where you're like, all right, no, I'm tired of this. That that's when I found out my wife was pregnant. That was the day I was like, you know what? I'm tired of, you know, relying upon others to do what I can do. And I'm tired. So I was just like, I'm going to figure out a way that I can be home more that I can paint and that I can still ride my bike and get paid to do that, you know? And but that to, next year to get to that point did you have to go to a point of maximum despair like when you're out in europe with bmc racing in belgium are you in a dark place are you starting to hate the sport or are you making these decisions oh, yeah of... i hated the sport i hated the sport like every day basically like it's literally felt like uh like just this something you're again like i said a river you're swimming upstream like and you just you know when i'm living in europe you know and it sounds like crazy or like always oh, like that's harsh, but it's like, no, like I love the sport and I love it. There were days I purely loved it, but most of the day to get out on the bike, to go train and do all that work, like to do all that. And it just, for me, I just hated it. Like, and it just like, I, it started getting worse because, you know, it just wasn't enjoying to me. And I look back now and I realize, like, man, I just was honestly way over training. You know, I wasn't allowing my body to rest then you know and it's like it's just a young kid's mentality living in europe racing for a bmc you know a belgian kind of team and thinking oh the more you train the better you're going to be as well you know and I, I was still a kid like i 
you know, you're growing, you're still developing and to be over training like that, like, you know, I didn't need that because then I'd show up to races and be way too gassed, you know, but I always wanted to impress my coaches through training peaks, you know? Yeah. And <laughs> crazy. You, you would think like by the time you get to the level of BMC that you've advisors around, you have coaches around you that are just saying, like, take it back a bit. You're going down a road that so many riders have gone down before of overtraining, under eating, over racing, and underperforming. Yeah, but I mean, they don't they don't care because there's so many other cyclists that, and like, you're just another fish in this in the pool where it's like, oh, if you don't work out, they got it, someone right next to you. You know what I mean? They got so so. It's uh, I don't, I mean, again, I'm not trying to ever like. I don't want to make it look like I'm negative or like negative about because like i'm not like i'm super stoked about everything i did in my past and i'm just super grateful for like all the opportunities i had and the people i met like i i called up my swanya from bmc the other day and we just like it was so phenomenal to talk and catch up you know and i told him like we probably have a better time now than <laughs> when i was then and i was so like tight you know and so like paranoid and not so about cycling and weight and all that nonsense. Can you remember and, your numbers from back then? Like what sort of CTL were you rocking back then? I don't even know what that is. Uh, you're not Honestly, into the data like, at all. No. And like, I just, I like, I just love the riding. And like, even now, like, I just also, I'm pretty good people. I don't know. I'm pretty good at just cutting out information I don't need. So like, why do I need to know that information? Even if I didn't re know that information years ago, I don't know what it is. I don't know things. I cut things out of my mind that I don't, that take up the space of my creativity. Do you ride? And like, I've, no way. I don't even ride with a computer now. I just will turn on Strava on my phone and like just put it in my pocket. And that's like the most tech I get. Uh, but yeah, I don't, just because I don't, that, that's what killed. That was the reason I hated the bike. Like, because I'd go out and ride and one day you'd, you'd achieve such beautiful numbers and the next you couldn't, or a few, uh, next week you, you weren't able to, or, and you'd, you'd always then look at yourself like, like oh, I'm just, I like you, that's the issue is you, you, you achieve a number and it's not, you realize, oh, okay, well I, I can do more. Let's try to do more. And so you're just constantly searching for more and it, you realize like now, like I said, it doesn't give you any satisfaction or like it doesn't make you happy and it's like like i think back now and i'm just like when you're in the kind of in the real world and out of the cycling bubble and you realize like man uh, like nobody even cares if i walk up and tell them like some stranger oh yeah this was my power number up this climb yeah. I, I have the fastest time up this climb i'm just like uh, you know what but like someone does care when i walk up to them and we have a great conversation about like my artwork or life or you know what they're up to you know what i mean like but you know to, people... to extend that one tj like i have world tour guys on the podcast all the time and like they're in this very tiny little incestuous cycling bubble but honestly like general public maybe excluding you know people who are diehard cycling anoraks no one gives a fuck that you were top 10 in the three days of the panya like Man, nobody, nobody, I don't have a job now because I won races. I didn't win any races last year. I don't plan on any winning any races in my future. Like if I do, that would be sweet and very lucky, you know, like I would, that'd be awesome, but that'd be crazy lucky. Like, and the thing is like, people don't follow me and people don't, you know, like what I have to say on social media or, or like what I'm doing because of you know, races I won or how fast I go on the bike. And I realized that I realized that people were just really following me and liked who I was or wanted to support me, whether that be sponsors like monster or Santa Cruz, because they loved the person I was and they loved the light that like when I was truly being myself, it, it, it just shined, you know, it was amazing when Santa Cruz approached us, you know, me and my teammate, Andrew, and they're, you know, the guy at Santa Cruz told the big boss, like, you know what the best thing to do for these guys is just like give them the bikes and just let them be free like let's not because <laughs> like there was this debate whether to put us on the factory team they're like u.s cup racing team they're out like that's with keegan swenson tobin they're all out in uh uh arkansas racing right now 
And so there was this debate to put us on that team, but that team's just more geared towards racing and performance. And our side of like the reason they wanted to get us was to be kind of just more creative and be, you know, that kind of more free spirited and to show the people like, Oh, this is, you know, like, I don't know. You care more about the good. I, I felt like when I, it came time to me approaching these sponsors to start imaginary collective, I, you know, needed to think of a reason like, okay, well I can't approach them and say like, you know, because I want to win this race or that race. Like, cause then if you don't, they're not going to sponsor you the next year. Well, talk to us about imaginary collective. Talk to us about this idea of redesigning cycling. So this is your sort of phase two in your cycling career. It's Mm -hmm. the quote there a minute ago, which I thought's a nice way to sum it up. Like you're not racing to win anymore. It's about the journey and the laughs and the stories along the way. And is that what you mean by reimagining and redesigning cycling? Yeah, I, I felt like we were really marketing high end sport to everyone. Like only there's out of ninety nine percent of people, only one percent knows. Okay, that this, you know, point. Uh, like you know those little minuscule things the the cycling world would promote. You know, or the skin suits, or you know, it's like you walk, you go around town and you see just a local person rolling a TT bike with full disc and TT helmet. And it's just because the guy at the bike shop, you know, the cycling world sold them on that. When that guy would be way happier on a gravel bike with fatter tires that he can go and be totally free with, you know, a, a bag on the front and actually enjoy. And I just felt like instead of targeting the people that, you know, really want to win and everything, because I just felt like, they're already doing that. They're stripping bikes down of paint. They're making them all black and just carbon and like, yeah, they're st fast and stealthy, but like, I just missed like the map. Hey, you know, I missed like the expression, the personality. And, you know, for me, that was a big thing. And it was funny because yeah, I saw you talk to Corey Williams and yeah, he's uh, when I was, yeah, they're, I've known them since I was, you know, since Corey started racing. We started racing the same year because we we're same age. And we've always raced against each other, you know. And uh, when I, 2019, my final year of racing, I contacted them at the beginning of the year. And I was talking to Justin that whole spring about joining Legion. And just because I really believed in their project, I just, I mean, they started all that, you know. They started that creativity and that. You know, and I was like, well, it started kind of hitting me when I did D Dirty Kanza. And I was like, I love gravel. You know, I love this expression. I love showing up to this event that thousands of people are at. And they're all just here loving to be here. Like, they're just loving riding bikes. You know, maybe th 10 people out of those thousands will care about winning the race. The, uh, the rest just care about the good time. And the journey that it, it goes through and you meet so many people and i realized like wow me just riding and meeting people is a bigger impact than me at the front of the race solo winning you know i'm 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 so connecting more dots and that allowed me to like you know then i was like i contacted justin and i was like all right you know i'm just going to do my own kind of my own you know gravel thing you know and my own vibe and it's so fun like we talk to each other like when i go to la or something i hit him up and like, you know, they're just always inspiring. And we're just always getting these talks about new creative outlets and new, you know, vibes because uh, we're just trying to make the sport. I'm just trying to make the sport just fun and inviting and more artistic rather than performance, you know, or, you know, just people feeling overwhelmed by that. I want them to just jump on their bike and feel cool and just go ride. <laughs> so talk to me about uh, art is another passion of yours talk to me about where art and cycling meet because it seems to me cycling is i don't want to say completely devoid of personality because we do have some great characters like sagan and, and it's funny the yeah. sagan's worth seems to be vanderpool vanderpool is a good character but then we have like you know quintana is a shit character a lot of the colombians are pretty i mean that, i want to i don't want to ever talk like i said negatively on people or talk ill on people's character because people are like if the world was full of everyone like me that would be a pretty terrible world or if the world like there there just needs to be one me there needs to be you know and there needs to be one this person and it's like like i like i said 
like we people in the cycling maybe not like certain people's ways but man like i said i would never i don't want to talk negatively on people but uh i just think you know i i, I like i'm not ever trying to be like a character to be a character but that, like I think a lot I of think, people think I think I rather am. rather than like talking negative about character, I think it, it's unfair about Quintana and Bernal maybe because it's a language barrier thing. But if you look more so at what Ineos do or Team Sky, where they're actually stripping personality away from riders, they're cutting away yeah. any liberties they have in the press. And we're just seeing like it's nearly like uh, Empire Strikes Back. Like you're I getting mean, but those riders also lineup. you know, that's just the sport. Like those riders also sign that contract. They they knew what they were signing into, and those riders also are getting compensated. So if those riders, like a lot of people, you have to like, you know, like I said, it's a hard discussion because I think I think in the world tour, it's hard to not have that. You're gonna have that where it's more serious about numbers. And for me, at the beginning, I was thinking like, oh man, the world tour needs to change this. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot of things the UCI needs to change. They suck. But the world tour, like the world tour is just always going to be a race. And to think that it's not is silly, you know, but it used to have but a bit of panache. People, Remember Marco Pantani, like rocking oh, yeah. the bandana and stuff. Like there was some panache but to that's, it. We lost our way somewhere. Cocaine. Those guys were doing cocaine then, you know, yeah, so that's not what came you're going to though. He still had a bit of belt. Like, I'm just saying that's like the culture of the sport and the culture then was a whole lot different now. I mean, like you said, you were talking to this young athlete the other day. And that young kid is like to sleep probably by eight o'clock, you know, like his schedule is probably up at seven, eating his oats on his bike, by, uh, getting dressed by 930, riding at 10. Like, you know, their schedule and that's just the life because they can't mess around like riders used to because or else they're going to be dropped before the flag. Like I said, the training is so hard now that you, you have to take it that seriously. And so like, I realized like, you can't be mad at them for not having energy. I mean, maybe they could be better with interviews for sure. But also, like, if you're going for characters or for more fun or for p stories or life, like, you just need to know, like, oh, I need to go to a gravel event or I need to yeah. uh, watch uh, a cyclocross race or a mountain bike race or, you know, like, if you're watching a road race, you, know, you have to realize you're watching something that's, all right, the break's going to go. Peloton is going to roll like they're going to chase them down the climber. You know what I mean? There's always going to be that little bit of panache now, but it, the racing is so hard that they can't like that little bit of slip, you know, they can't allow that because so, then they're getting dropped. So is the space we need to move into instead of like your amateur, you know, dentist who's 45 years old, instead of him trying to, you know, buy the Pinarello prints and look like, you know, uh, one of the, the Ineos boys, yeah. Hopefully we get that move where instead of trying to turn into one of the storm ship troopers, he's starting to pick those gravel role models like like yourself, Ted King, Pete Stetton. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, man. I mean, that would be I like I said, I don't I'm not trying to be literally if there's one thing I just want people to know about me or like me, it's just that I'm trying to just be myself every day. Like I'm not I'm not trying to be like, oh, I need to post this to be this character so people can follow me or I need to be this character at a race. It's like, if you're meeting me, you're, you're meeting me. Like, I'm real. I'm authentic. Like, I'm going to have a real talk with you and chat. Like, I'm easygoing. Like, and I, like, I, I've learned that vulnerability and that openness through meditation, you know? And like I said, once you have, like, like you, you know, you, like you said, you, I have just no negative energy anymore. So like thinking even about the road scene or like, Oh man, they need it. I don't even have space for that because that takes up space in your mind. That take up, takes up space where then you can't be as creative and it, you can't be as happy. And like, they always say it like the moment you let free of like, okay, I like just, I don't have any control of that or I don't have control of like, then who cares, you know, just focus on your life and be you. And it's crazy. Then you show up and, I think people just like me and follow me be, or like, you know, follow me on social media. It's stupid to say, like, I don't even have that many followers, but like, I think people just maybe respect me in the ways just because like I said, my honesty now. And like, I just, am well, always you're, trying you're to be walking a different path, nice. I think, which is always interesting because it, 
we don't know where it's going to turn out. It's a new experiments that we haven't. Really oh man. I might not even be in cycling in like a couple of years. Who knows? You know what I mean? Like I, and that's, that's the beauty is I'm not afraid. A lot of people, you know, get really terrified about what's next or like, Oh, what am I going to do after sport? You know? And I get that. But for me, I just don't have any fear. Like I just know I'll be good at whatever I'll do. Like it's not hard to be good at whatever you do. It just takes putting in the work and the time. Like uh, if I wanted much, to sell more, how much is that sort I, of discipline and experience? How much is that transferring across your new artistic process? Oh, that, I mean, yeah, the discipline I learned through cycling and through sport, you know, but I was learning discipline uh, when I was a child through sport, through baseball. You know, I remember being like eight years old and throwing baseballs for three hours. And so it's like cycling wasn't all of a sudden, you know, this first thing that taught, it taught me a lot more discipline and it taught, and it really showed me like, and it really showed me now that, okay, the more work, the more days you ride, the the better you're going to be. If you ride every day, you're going to be better. So if you paint every day, you're going to be better. If you do a podcast every day, you're going to be better. If you like, if you just put the work in, it's pretty simple. You're going to be better. You're going to be shitty at the beginning and you're going to suck at the beginning, just like anyone does. And that's the part everyone can't get over because they can't get over their ego and realizing that, oh, I'm going to suck. Like for me, I know I'm going to suck, man. Like anytime like you start something, that's what you have to know is I'm going to fail. It's over time that you get better. And over time that you've built something that then people look up to you and are like, wow, how, how did you get here? And you're like, man, brick by brick. Is day there a cautionary tale in your cycling where you took something beautiful that you loved and you took it to an extreme and you grew to hate it? Is there a cautionary tale there for now that you're embarking on an artistic journey? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just know that feeding one, one source drains all, up, all else. You have to balance, you know? So I just know that back then when I was only feeding the cycling source, I was killing, you know, off everything else. And so then you think what will make you happy and you think that you're doing the right thing because you feel like, oh, I'm sacrificing and I'm doing this. And it's like, no, like you should have a balance. But again, I don't ever want to sound like I'm trying to tell someone what they're doing or try to tell people that I, they're not living right because I've found what works for me. And it's been working amazing and I love life and, but I would, I'm not ever going to, you know, preach that because I, I, I've really realized that through meditation, like preaching is just, it's almost like you're trying to fill their heads. Like they'll find it when they need it. And if they don't find it, then like, you, you know, know, I think the contrast works super well, whether it's like. I love to ride my bike now. I don't have to ride my bike every day, but if I'm stuck on the computer, if I'm recording podcasts, if mm -hmm. I'm indoors, I love that contrast to getting outside, riding my bike, even if it's pissing rain. But if I have to ride my bike every single day, that's the thing that becomes the monotony. And then now the contrast is I actually like sitting there and watching Netflix. I, I when you're too all consumed with one pursuit and you, you don't have that pain, pleasure contrast to, Mm -hmm. give it like a, a perspective and that's where i've come into a lot of problems in the past whether it's been you know excessively studying for years and then just losing the love for reading and now i'm able to find that love for reading again because i'm not forcing yeah. academia down my throat yeah man yeah no i uh yeah that's definitely i feel like just the biggest thing for me was yeah just not you know strangling it all with one thing you know i'm definitely balancing it out and doing so many things that it, i mean that's like my studio it's full of more things than just you know canvases and I, i'm always doing more than just painting i'm always maybe coming up with designs or thinking of other ideas or thinking of creative ideas to do marketing or thinking of you know i've realized that as an artist it's not just doing something creative it's doing it creative your every day it's just being you i like that's what's so funny is being yourself is being an artist people just put on a mat like well i mean they put on masks now every day but for but you know metaphorically you put on a this mask of like oh i have to do this and it's like 
no every all of us are artists it's just knowing how to express it through our daily use you know me doing this podcast is a work of art like it's art of you know conversation you know and it's if i'm investing myself in it right now and i'm in it with mentally you know aware everything then you're putting your energy to make it great you know what i mean it's not like you're coming on here and reading a script like oh it's noon all right i got to do this podcast roll through it all right that was great like asking questions doing this 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 like man you just got to let it flow you like, know and the it's more funny because you... uh, every podcast i do almost like i've got a, a couple of pages of like questions and prompts there i literally haven't asked one question <laughs> off that page yet no yeah i you know that's i try to get it's hard i try to get a lot of my guests on my podcast to like open up like that and mo i can get a lot of people too i feel like that's kind of a a power or strength I have is to make someone feel like if I can let someone know that I'm vulnerable and they can see that I'm open, then it's crazy. The things people will tell you, like it's wild how then open people will tell you and the things they'll open up about. I mean, I've been out on rides and you know, you'll be out with these like grown ass dudes that are super tough. And then next thing you know, they'll be like telling you a really like emotional story. And it's like, you don't even know maybe that guy for that long, but like, just because they can see that you're open and that you're, you know, you're just this ball of energy of receiving, then people open up and it's, it creates relationships and bonds that then are just beautiful because people then can trust you, you know, and they just know that you're always being yourself, you know, rather because you can see it when people are like trying to like be someone else and like you'll, you're like, man, you just need to chill. Like, I know that's not you. And what's quite fulfilling for me with the podcast, and I suppose I want to respectfully your time, I don't want to take too long. We'll wrap it up on this. Uh, I, you just, you never know who it's, you know, I don't want to say inspiring because it's almost a little bit corny, but you're never sure who it's touching. Like I get Instagram DMs and one only like a few months ago from a cyclist who'd had a bad accident and he was in a wheelchair and he sent me a message saying like, your podcasts have really got me through my therapy in the last few months. And I was just like, blown away like i had no idea that, that something i was recording in a room in my apartment could have an impact on somebody at such a pivotal moment in their life man even if it was two people listening to your podcast like that's what people forget is like they always think oh i'm gonna i can't save the world or i can't help the world because like it's too big or that's like it's like no you should just be focusing on the people you are talking to, you know, the people that are in your world. Like if you only have 10 people that are listening to your podcast every week, but they're listening, like those people, like, you know what I mean? They, it's, you never know. Like, and you just need to touch one. You just need to inspire one person. Like, that's the thing is like, if you're talking, you know, I'm a big, big, like, you know, supporter of peace, love, positivity, talking about depress, you know, depression and helping people with, depression and suicide prevention you know because i just believe like we need to talk and you know love each other you know and like it's crazy just you know this you know we'll just be too caught up and we don't want to talk or we don't want to express ourselves fully i feel like and uh yeah it's well, just i think it's especially a problem in podcast land and social media land in general because we look and we've even referenced it in this chat we look at a, a wit score like how many downloads that i get how many followers do i have that's like the wit when that's the wrong way Man. to measure it. we should be looking at depth we should be looking at well what the impact that it's having on each individual person well and the fact that like if you had a hundred to 500 people listen to your podcast let's say it's an hour long that's 500 people that gave an hour of their day to listen to a stranger and to me that's just an insane because if you just think about how valuable an hour is to your day and again and you're you don't know people and it's like again you never know who you'll inspire and affect like you know i'll always talk about peace love and positivity you know and you know people will message me and be like hey man like I was having a lot of negativity, negative thoughts or this, that, you know, and, you know, you just being this positive. And it's like, I realize, you know, this is not me being arrogant. I realize that there's people that do listen to me and follow me. So I might as well use that as a tool and use that as like spreading positivity, you know, and spreading good rather than trying to just like 
show them as someone I'm not, you know what I mean? Like trying to just pretend like, Oh, I'm this. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> just fake. We could talk all night before I let you go. Uh, do us a favor, give a, a shout out. Where can people follow you on Instagram? What's your podcast? Yeah. Yeah. Just give uh, my Instagram a follow. It's just TJ Eisenhart. And then my podcast is uh, the next stage. And that's like on all the all platforms uh like itunes spotify stuff uh and then yeah just give like also on you know on uh instagram or my my uh company imaginary collective uh if you want to keep up with that but yeah no i just appreciate you know the time and having me on man tj it was brilliant to really enjoy chatting i'm definitely going to get you over to europe for a gravel race now yeah man that sounds so fun that would be oh man i can't wait i i really wanted to do the iceland race last year uh the rift that one looks super radical uh but yeah i can't wait to like be traveling like crazy again <laughs> thanks for chatting man. radical man have a good one bye